the Civil War Battle Series, the Battle of Honey Springs. After the battle, 300 pairs of shackles were discovered on the Confederate supply train. Brigadier General Douglas H. Cooper intended to bring back the brave men of the 1st Kansas. However, the men of the 1st Kansas had other plans. The Battle of Honey Springs, the climatic engagement of the Civil War in Indian Territory, was fought on July 17, 1863, and had been in the making since the beginning of the war. More than two years earlier, the United States government had withdrawn its small peacekeeping forces from the forts of Indian Territory for what it considered more urgent military needs in the East. Soon afterwards, authorities of the Confederate States signed treaties of alliance with the five tribes, and for a year, Confederate control of Indian Territory remained unchallenged. Then, as part of an overall plan for conquering the Confederacy, federal forces invaded Indian Territory. After a year of unsuccessful efforts to reestablish federal authority, Colonel William A. Phillips of Kansas occupied Fort Gibson in April of 1863, and Confederate authority in Indian Territory was successfully challenged for the first time. The Confederates made plans to drive the Federals from Fort Gibson, while Colonel Phillips struggled to keep his supply line open to Fort Scott, Kansas, 175 miles to the north. The Confederates assembled 20 miles south of Fort Gibson at Funny Springs. From this location, Confederate cavalry detachments harassed the Federals at Fort Gibson and attacked supply trains en route to Fort, from Fort Scott. Through the encampment ran the Texas Road, the main pre-war transportation route connecting Indian Territory with Texas, Kansas, Missouri, and Arkansas. Honey Springs had served for some years as a stage stop, provision point, and watering place of the Texas Road. Early in the Civil War, it became an important depot for the Confederates. It took on increased significance as the Confederates planned to drive all Federal forces from Indian Territory during the mid-summer of 1863. For this purpose, about 6,000 soldiers were collected. Supplies were brought from Fort Smith, Arkansas, as well as from Boggy Depot, Fort Cobb, Fort Arbuckle, and Fort Washita, all located in Indian Territory. The Confederates at Honey Springs were ready to march on Fort Gibson and wait at the arrival of approximately 3,000 reinforcements in addition to artillery support from Fort Smith on July 17 under the command of Brigadier General William L. Cable a West Point graduate distinguished for bravery in combat. In command of the Confederate forces at Honey Springs was Brigadier General Douglas H. Cooper, a former United States Choctaw Chickasaw Indian agent and a former veteran of the Mexican War. He was highly respected by the Indians he faithfully served in both civil and military life. Confederate deserters and Federal spies had kept Colonel Phillips informed of the impending attack on Fort Gibson. Supplies and troops were rushed from Fort Scott. On July 1st and 2nd at Cabin Creek, Confederate forces attempted to intercept a large military supply train of 200 wagons en route to Fort Gibson. They did not succeed, and the Federals were able to hold Fort Gibson and prepare for an offensive against the Confederate forces at Honey Springs. The supply train had barely reached its destination destination when Major General James G. Blunt arrived from Kansas with additional troops and artillery. Altogether, only about 3,000 Federals were then at Fort Gibson and available for field operations. Information soon reached Blunt that Cable planned to bring 3,000 men to join Cooper's 6,000 Confederate troops for the planned attack on Fort Gibson. Blunt's background was unique. Although first a sailor, he became a physician by profession and a general through politics. Before he assumed command of the District of the Frontier, which was his assignment in the summer of 1863, his military campaigns had been uniformly successful and strongly characterized by offensive operations. The challenge of again taking the battle to the Confederates was before him. In addition, he considered the Federal situation at Fort Gibson especially critical because of the anticipated arrival of Cable's troops at Honey Springs on July 17th. Thus, Blunt took immediate action to attack Cooper's forces before Cable could bring reinforcements, but on July 14th, several days after starting campaign preparations at Fort Gibson, Blunt came down with an intense fever due to encephalitis. 
Although still severely ill after spending all day in bed, he decided to bring the advance on Honey Springs because of Cable's threat. With the completion of the construction of a number of flatboats to ferry his forces across the Arkansas River, Blunt issued six days of rations to his men. He then took 250 cavalry and four pieces of light artillery at midnight on July 15th and rode about 13 miles up the north bank of the swollen Arkansas River to a ford. At this location, he drove away the Confederate pickets, crossed the Arkansas River, and turned downstream to the mouth of the Grand River. Blunt then ordered ordered the remainder of his troops to cross the river. The Union forces consisted of about 3,000 men equipped with late-model Springfield rifles and 12 pieces of artillery, including several efficient Napoleon guns. Blunt's men proceeded immediately down the Texas Road. At about midnight during a rain shower, the first skirmish occurred near Chimney Mountain, when the Union advance guard encountered a Confederate scouting party. It was then that the Confederates, who slowly fell back, discovered that some of their gunpowder had absorbed moisture and sometimes would not fire. At daybreak, Blunt's cavalry came upon Confederate advance units about five miles north of Elk Creek, skirmished briefly, and drove the Confederates back to their main line. While the Confederate was collecting north of Elk Creek on the Texas Road, Blunt and his staff rode forward to examine the main Confederate position. He discovered their line about one and one-half miles wide, concealed in the timber immediately north of Elk Creek. At about 8 a.m., he ordered his wet and exhausted troops to rest and eat behind a little ridge about one-half mile from the Confederate line. At about 10 a.m., Blunt formed his force into columns, one to the left of the road under Colonel William A. Phillips and the other on the right under Colonel William R. Judson. Both columns moved to within a quarter mile of the Confederate line and then were rapidly deployed to the left and right. In less than five minutes, they were in a line of battle across the entire Confederate front. Blunt's force was composed of units from Wisconsin, Colorado, Kansas, and Indian Territory. On the other side, the Confederate units, with 5,700 men present for duty in the battle, were arranged in battle formation as Brigadier General Cooper had directed three days before the engagement. About one quarter of them were without serviceable firearms, and they were supported by only four pieces of light artillery. Several units of Texans were serving with the Indian forces. Colonel Stan Waddy had been scheduled to be present at Honey Springs, but at the last minute was sent by Cooper with a small cavalry unit to conduct a diversionary movement in the direction of Weber's Falls. All available Confederate forces were to be committed in case of an attack, except for the 1st Choctaw and Chickasaw Regiment and two squadrons of Cap Texas Cavalry, which were to be held in reserve. The Confederates opened the battle by firing on the Federal artillery, which replied with spherical case shot, shell, and solid shot for one and one quarter hours. The four Confederate field pieces of Captain Roswell W. Lee consisted of three 12-pounder mountain howitzers and a scarce Confederate mountain rifle, an even smaller experimental bronze field piece rifled to take a two-and-a-quarter-inch diameter explosive shell. Only 18 of these were made by the Tredegar Ironworks in Richmond, Virginia in 1862. The Federal artillery consisted of 12 field pieces brought from Kansas under the command of Captain Edward A. Smith and Henry Hopkins. Six of these cannons were the big 12-pounder Napoleons, with which the Union Army was generally equipped. Two of the field pieces were iron six-pounders, and four were 12-pounder mountain howitzers, mountain on prairie carriages. During the early minutes of the artillery duel, the four Confederate mountain cannons concentrated their fire on the four Napoleons of the Kansas Infantry Regiment. One of the Napoleons took a direct hit, thus removing one Federal gun from action, but the Federal gunners quickly located one of the Confederate howitzers in the underbrush and put it out of action by concentrated fire on of two of the big Napoleons. Within minutes, the little howitzers were wrecked and its entire crew and horses were killed. The Confederate artillerymen then utilized the accuracy and long range of their experimental mountain rifle field piece to pick off Union officers who could be seen on the high open ground beyond the Union battle line. One of Major General Blunt's aides was killed by a shell from the little mountain rifle, and another shell narrowly missed Captain Smith from while he directed the fire of his battery. Meanwhile, Blunt had 
dismounted his cavalry units to fight as infantry, and ordered all commands to fire rapidly as possible against the Confederate line. For over two hours, the Confederates effectively held their position while attempting a spirited flanking movement on the Federal left. The fighting in the underbrush was slow, moving, and confusing as the line swayed under the impact of close-in and hand-to-hand combat. With many more men committed to the battle than were available to the Federals, the Confederates appeared to be compensating satisfactorily for their inferior gunpowder, firearms, and artillery. Then a set of unusual circumstances prevailed to turn the tide of the battle. Blunt ordered Colonel James M. Williams, the commanding officer of the 1st Kansas Colored Volunteer Infantry Regiment, located near the center of the Federal line, to capture the four-gun Confederate artillery battery supporting the 20th and 29th Texas Cavalry Regiments. Williams of abolitionist beliefs had told his men before the battle that no quarter would be given if they were captured. He then ordered them to fix bayonets and move forward in formation. Soon the Federal and Confederate lines fired sim- simultaneously. Colonel Williams and Colonel Charles de Morse of the 29th Texas Cavalry Regiment received severe but not fatal injuries. Incessant fire continued. As the battle progressed, units of the Federal 2nd Indian Home Guard Regiment unintentionally moved in between the 1st Kansas Colored Volunteer Regiment and the Texas Dismounted Cavalry Regiments. Williams successor, Lieutenant Colonel John Balls, ordered the Indians to fall back to their position in the battle line. The Confederates heard this command and assumed that the Federals were falling back. Thinking the Federals were in for full retreat, the order was given to pursue the Federals, and Confederates approached to within 25 paces of the Federals to be met with a volley from the deadly accurate Springfield rifles of the Kansas Colored Regiment. The Confederate color bearer fell, but the colors were immediately raised and again promptly shot down. They were raised again and once more they were leveled by a volley from the Kansas regiment. Then federal soldiers from the Indian Home Guards picked up the Confederate colors, much to the dismay of men and officers from the Kansas regiment, who asked permission to break ranks and secure them. Permission was refused, but they were promised that the matter would be righted later. Realizing he could no longer hold his position north of Elk Creek, Cooper ordered his Confederate forces to remove the artillery, vigorously defending the bridge across the creek, and stand firm on the south bank of the stream. They made several determined efforts to hold the bridge, but finally superior firepower prevailed. Many Texans died holding the bridge long enough to move the Confederate artillery across it. The final but effective stand was made, mainly by the Reserve Choctaw and Chickasaw Regiment and the two squadrons of Texas Cavalry, giving the Confederates time to evacuate virtually all of their forces, artillery, and baggage train. All buildings and supplies at Honey Springs were fired by the retreating Confederates. The Federals arrived soon enough to extinguish some of the flames and save quantities of bacon, dried beef, flour, sorghum, and salt. Also found were 300 pairs of slave shackles, which Cooper and his men intended on using to bring the escaped slaves back to slavery. A sobering reminder of what the brave men of the 1st Kansas were fighting for. By 2 p.m. the battle was over. Four hours after it began, the Confederates moved east from the battlefield and at about 4 p.m. joined Brigadier General Cable's 3,000-man force en route with four mountain howitzers from Fort Smith, about 50 miles distant. If Cable had arrived in time for the battle, the Federals were likely have lost. Cooper attributed his defeat not only to inferior ammunition and superior Federal arms, but also to the lack of Cable's reinforcements. Blunt decided not to pursue the Confederates because his men and horses were fatigued and his ammunition was almost exhausted. Still suffering from an intense fever that forced him to go to bed, he orders his forces to bivouac for the night on the battlefield, treat the wounded, and bury the dead, including the Confederates. Late on the day following the battle, Blunt directed his forces to return to Fort Gibson. Cooper reported his losses as 134 killed and wounded, with 47 taken prisoner. The May maintained the federal killed and wounded exceeded 200. Blunt reported his losses as 17 killed and 16 wounded. He said he buried 150 Confederates, wounded 400 of their men, and took 77 prisoners. The exact numbers will never be known. 
Kipper afterwards sent a letter of appreciation to Blunt for his burial of the Confederate dead. Their unmarked graves may still be in the Honey Springs area. The bodies of the Confederate dead were later reinterred in the Fort Gibson National Cemetery. It's your history. Learn it. Know it. Love it.